thought we'd post a video here about the five things that I always end up repeating to my intermediate students. Um, I also did a video for one of my beginner students, but these are a little bit more advanced concepts. And certainly after all the years of teaching cello, these come up pretty much every lesson. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So the first one would be uh, squeezing with the thumbs. Um, this is a really common issue to have in string playing because our thumbs are meant to grab things, right? So it's intuitive for us to squeeze a little bit with our thumbs, but we don't want to do that, uh, you know, for playing the cello. It doesn't help. So in the right hand, uh, squeezing with your thumb can cause a couple things to happen. Uh, first of all, the thumb could lock back like that, mm -hmm. uh, which isn't good technique. And uh, overall, it just doesn't help promote flexibility and um, seamless bowing. So uh, try to keep your right thumb relaxed and just maybe be aware, are you squeezing with your thumb or are you relaxed with your bow hold? Uh, in the left hand, this is probably more common for squeezing to happen in the left hand because we have to depress the string when we play. Uh, and it's just real intuitive to want to counteract on the back of the cello and squeeze the thumb to help the string go down. Um, but we don't want to do that. Uh, it's not productive for vibrato. Uh, it limits your range of motion for vibrato. It also doesn't let you shoot shift smoothly. So just make sure that you're not squeezing with your left thumb either. And instead, you should feel like that you're pulling the string down with the weight of your elbow and your arm. Um, and the stronger your fingers get, uh, playing on the tips of your fingers will help, then the easier it'll be to let go and liberate the thumb. And this will open up good vibrato and shifting as well. So uh, probably the second thing would be... Yeah, the second thing is preparing your shifts. So whenever you're about to make a shift, uh, what you would, you would like to do is kind of make a C motion with your arm to try to prepare that shift in the same way on the, on the way down. Um, you had a really great analogy that you had mentioned earlier that uh, if you're a pitcher, a uh, baseball pitcher, and you're about to throw the ball, you don't just do that. You have to like go back, prepare the throw, and then follow through. And it's exactly the same thing with preparing your shifting. Right. Yeah. Um, another key thing whenever you're preparing your, sh whenever you're doing your shifting, uh, I commonly see uh, people try to shift and not bring their thumb with them. They tend to like leave the, it might be easier from this angle, they tend to like leave the thumb behind. Just remember the thumb and the second finger are buddies and they need to shift together and that's gonna make for a much smoother shift. If you remember to bring your thumb with you um, and on that topic, uh, whenever you're doing your C motion shift to thumb position, uh, I see commonly that some people leave their thumb behind when they're trying to go to thumb position and you always wanna have either a half step or a whole step, whole step, uh, uh, I guess interval in between your thumb and your first finger. You don't want to have a very wide interval, so making sure that the thumb is always coming with you. And that preparatory motion is always really, really helpful whenever you're doing that shift. Yeah. So what she was talking about with the C motion is your elbow will make the letter C for up shifts and for backward shifts will make a kind of a reverse C mm -hmm. sort of motion. And what this does is just breaks the static motion and gets your arm you know, uh, in motion, right? So we don't just want to move there quickly. We want to time it with the rhythm and shift accordingly. So. See how I've, I'm thinking of a tempo. One and two and, and I'm also preparing that motion. So the arm kind of breathes. Uh, and a lot of time my intermediate students, they still have trouble shifting because they're either A, not thinking in tempo or moving in tempo or B, not preparing the gesture uh, with some sort of motion from the elbow that would kind of like, like we said, throwing a baseball. We have to wind up first and then throw. We don't just shot put the ball. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Anyway, so that, that would be the second thing is, is preparing shifts. Um, the third thing is the elbow in the bow hand, uh, I see this all the time, the elbow creeps up, and, uh, especially when um, we're playing on the A string. So if this is happening to you, remind yourself to lower your elbow 
and instead allow your fingers the flexibility to bring the bow over to the A string. So if you're if you find yourself holding your elbow up, you might get a weaker sound, but overall it's just going to suspend all this energy up in your arm instead of relaxing and just playing with the elbow pretty low. You know, the C string is so important for low elbow because we need more leverage. It's a thicker string. So just something to be aware of with your elbow. I see this a lot. We call it the ugly elbow disease. And it creeps up like that. So. Yep. Uh, so the fourth one is the finger flexing in the bow hole. And you just touched on that. Yeah. Um, this is where a lot of the different colors with your bow can really, really come from, and also a very smooth and seamless bow change. Uh, there's a little exercise that uh, uh, one of our cello teachers talked about called growing strings, and it's about, the goal with this is to have a really smooth bow change, as smooth as you can possibly get it. And a lot of that comes from the very subtle like raising and uh, pulling of the fingers with the bow. Yeah, you can think of uh, having your fingers all the way relaxed like that and then mm -hmm. flattening the hand mm -hmm. to this kind of shape. Yeah, we call this finger flexing. Yeah, finger flexing. And these are bow pull-ups, this exercise mm -hmm. right here. And you mm -hmm. see how that changes the angle of the bow. Mm -hmm. So we can think like C string would be relaxed and then as you come up all the way to the A string, that's where you flex up all the fingers in the hand. And the thumb comes along too for the, for the ride. So uh, you can do an exercise where you practice doing that and practice changing strings with just your finger. And your elbow is gonna move a little bit, but the fingers are gonna kinda help lead that motion over to the A string. Mm -hmm. um, so again, this creates really good string crossings. This is another good exercise to do to incorporate some flexing in your bow. So string crossings is really important. If I tried to play that Bach prelude with no finger flexing, it would look really funny, right? It takes a lot of work, but you get the fingers involved and all of a sudden we have much more fluidity in the string crossing and that all comes from finger flexing. Mm -hmm. So. Again, that's a common thing. I, I it comes up almost every lesson. Uh, my students having trouble with string crossings. Well, you're, you're you're crossing with the elbow only. You know, get the, let the fingers get involved. Mm -hmm. And the last one, you want to talk about this yeah, one? Yeah, this one's a real big one. So that we save the best for last. Always playing over the fingerboard. You're going to get a very very weak sound. I have some of my intermediate students come into the lessons and they're. <laughs> sound but it's just so weak and it's so quiet and you could really explore down closer to the bridge to really to really draw out a thicker sound out of your instrument this is where your instrument is really really going to vibrate and really speak i had a teacher that told me you're not just playing for the front row in the auditorium you're playing for the back row in the auditorium and if you're constantly playing over the fingerboard you're not going to sound confident and you're only going to be playing for the front row you want to aim your sound all the way to the back row yeah and uh over the fingerboard this is where the string doesn't have a whole lot of resistance so it's pretty easy to play here which is probably why a lot of students kind of stay in that area. Um, but challenge yourself to come down into the further contact points away from the fingerboard and closer to the bridge. Uh, there's more resistance here, but the, the sound is able to develop in more open ways and, and just get more nuances out of your tone uh, when you experiment with playing different contact points. You save the bridge for those pianos, pianissimos. Save the fingerboard. Mezzo pianos, or, yeah. sorry, the, the fingerboard. Save that region for those little shimmery, soft moments. And when you're really trying to play some sound, right by the bridge is where you want to be with the bow. Um, again, when I hear a student play, I've had this happen plenty of times, they play the piece all the way through and it sounds great. They didn't really mess up or anything but it was kind of bland and boring. And that's because they didn't change their contact point at all. It was kind of a very consistent sound. And in string playing, you want to have a tone that is varied of all kinds of different sounds and timbres and colors in the sound. 
So that comes from changing contact point, changing bow speed, and changing your arm weight. But uh, yeah, the easiest fix is, is explore away from the fingerboard with, with bowing. Mm -hmm. So anyway, if you kind of go through these, uh, these five things, you know, no squeezing with your thumbs, prepare your shifts, uh, make sure your elbow stays low when you're playing the shallow, um, finger flexing in the bow hand, and then getting away from the fingerboard all the time uh, with your contact point then I think you'll see an overall improvement in your plane, and, and these are just the mo five most common things that come up all the time in my lessons, and I'm always, always having to remind my students to continue to work on them and think about them. And uh, many times they, they think, oh, I'm not doing that anymore, but really they are. So just maybe double check and see if you're doing any of those and try to improve on them. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please check out onlinecellolessons.org. I have a whole uh, course of video lessons that I add content to every month, and, um, you get video lessons for each song or piece of music and sheet music um, there. So, uh, really cool website. And if you're really into learning cello online, I definitely recommend it. Thanks so much.